but only the center of the Earth is in exactly the right orbit. On the side closest to the moon, the moon's gravity is too strong, and the water there is pooled toward the moon into a bulge. On the opposite side, the moon's gravity is too weak to hold the water in place, and so there too, the water bulges outward, trying to escape. As the Earth wobbles around the Earth-Moon center of mass, it also rotates on its axis. And as the Earth rotates, it passes beneath the bulges. At those locations where the rotating Earth passes under the rising water, high tides occur. And at the points between, low tides occur. Two high tides and two low tides every day. And every day as well, the sun plays a role in the ongoing drama of the tides. Since the sun's gravity tugs at the earth like the moon's, it contributes to the tides in the same way. Though the sun's larger, its effect on the tides is about half that of the moon, because it's so much farther away from the earth. At full moon and at new moon, earth, the sun, and the moon fall into a straight line. Then the tidal effects of sun and moon reinforce each other and create the highest high tides and the lowest low tides. High and low, the tides rise and fall because the earth moves. In writing his theory, Galileo was not wrong in raising his pen in defense of Copernicus. It was a lonely battle, but at least in principle, he was not alone. In 1618, two years after the church warned Galileo to stop teaching such dangerous ideas, Johannes Kepler published a book called Harmony of the Worlds. More than an argument for the truth of Copernicus, this book was Kepler's proof that he himself had not lived a lie. Kepler not only attempted to unwrap and expose the secrets of the universe, he tried to tie up and explain them all all in one book, and with one all-encompassing synthesis of geometry, music, and astronomy. No work since Plato's in the Golden Age could match the ambitious nature of Kepler's harmony.